Thank you so much, Cynthia, and thanks to Shelley and Donald Rubin and the museum staff for hosting this uh, very timely discussion. Uh, artists have actually been at the forefront of developing technology for uh, several millennia. I know from my own studies that the uh, Dionysian theater competitions in ancient Greece not only introduced us to people like Sophocles and Euripides, but also developed the deus ex, ex machina and a lot of the basic stage machinery that uh, we currently use and has further been developed into uh, film special effects. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci was, of course, a scientist and engineer and uh, developed prototypes for a helicopter and a calculator and lots of other things, and he also had a pretty good reputation as a painter. Um, in the 1860s in France, the Lumiere brothers used their knowledge of physics to develop uh, the earliest form of motion pictures. Uh, and certainly today, uh, artists and arts organizations have been using uh, technology of all kinds, and most recently, and in particular, the focus of today's discussion, the internet to pursue and expand uh, work from uh, creation to archiving and exhibitory to uh, marketing. Uh, for example, the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Art History Timeline gets over a million hits a month. Uh, my 17-year-old daughter could not be uh, making do in her art history class without it. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera HD broadcasts, which were the source of much controversy and consternation initially, have proven to be very effective at reaching audiences and, in fact, expanding the number of ticket buyers who come see the, uh, quote, real thing, unquote. The Museum of Natural History is using technology in innovative ways in terms of wayfinding, and lots of organizations, particularly smaller ones, are using social media in particular to supplement marketing budgets that are not otherwise particularly robust. Uh, but there is a lot of accompanying anxiety about the relationship of technology and art. I think on the benign and positive side, uh, lots of exploration about how technology can advance and deepen audience outreach and uh, enhance the experience of committed audience members. On the more apocalyptic front, I think there's a lot of concern about whether technology will somehow supplant art which of course begs the question about the definitional line between uh, art and technology. And some of the extraordinary people we have uh, here on stage today will hopefully give us uh, their thoughts about that. So let me um, introduce our panelists. I believe that you all have uh, in-depth biographies. Um, so uh, this is the, the short version. We have uh, Amit Snood, who's currently the head of Google Art Project, participating from uh, London, where I gather uh, he's either six or seven hours ahead of us, so he's missing lunch, and we should be very grateful. Uh, Mark Donner, who's a Google engineering director and actually was the creator of Google Art Project, and we'll get to hear from Mark about how he had this extraordinarily uh, insightful idea in the first place. Uh, we're also joined by Seb Chan, who is the Director of Digital and Emerging Media at the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt, which is our National Design Museum located here in New York. Uh, the artist uh, and graphic designer George Colombo, who was the first person, I understand it, to create a New Yorker cover with an iPhone um, art making app. And Eve Moros Ortega, who is the managing director of Art 21 at uh, PBS. So, what I'm going to do is uh, start by asking everyone on the panel to briefly discuss uh, their work and uh, in relation to this particular topic, and then uh, open up for some conversation among the panelists. And then uh, I believe Cynthia is going to do some Q and A, so everybody will have a chance to talk with our extraordinary panelists. So, um, Mark, if I could uh, start with you, since again, this was your brainwave. If you could tell us a little bit about how this came to you. Uh, well, I was not alone, uh, so I don't want to claim all the credit for this, but um, uh, I was the, I grew up uh, born and raised here in Manhattan, uh, the child of starving artists, and uh, at about age 10 or 11, I concluded that uh, while I might want to be an artist, I was going to starve if I did so. Uh, <laughs> And so I became a scientist instead, but um, that didn't sort of end my, my fascination with art. And so um, I've sort of always been interested in this question of, of getting the sort of the digital world into the museums. Uh, and some years ago, I was uh, on my way over to my dentist and um, who's on the east side, and I, for a variety of calendar screw-ups, I was way too early. And so I did what I normally do, which is I sort of wandered into the Met um, and, uh, you know, if you go give them a penny, they'll let you in. Um, and uh, so I went in, I was visiting one of my favorite paintings. I don't remember which one it was, but 
uh, there was a group of people there, and I was doing what I normally do when I see a bunch of people sitting talking as I eavesdropped on them. And they were, <clears throat> uh, there were four of them, and they were from somewhere in the middle of the country. And as I listened to them, it was clear that this was their trip to New York, not this year's trip to New York, this month's trip to New York, but the one that they had been saving for for decades. And the fact that they were there looking at art in the, in the Metropolitan was, was sort of wonderful. And I sort of thought about their experience of this work other than this one time. And you know, they probably have a sort of a coffee table book where this thing that's this big was this big. And you know, in the, the colors there was rendered by some printing process to way too flat and way too limited. But that had been enough to inspire them to come and see this. And I said, gee, I wonder, you know, the Google, Art Pro the Google Book Project had started up a while ago. And I said, I wonder if we could begin to think about getting this stuff out to the world uh, through, the, through the web browser as well. And that led to some thinking. I knew some museum CIOs and had some discussions with them and wrote a blog post about it. And then I joined Google and said, gee, you know, we've got all these powerful tools. Could we be helpful to the museum world? And that sort of led to a bunch of conversations. Seb? Sure. Um, I've actually got a couple, a couple of slides I'd like to show you because I think there's some really interesting um, ways tech technology is beginning to shape both the in the in the gallery experience and the opportunities for uh, for that gallery experience to expand. So I'll just uh, jump up and do a couple. Right, so I've just joined the Cooper Hewitt from uh, the Powerhouse, the Powerhouse Museum in Sid Sydney. Uh, I was doing a lot of work there. Uh, we, we were basically a science and design mu museum, and I've just joined the Cooper Hewitt four months ago. Uh, but we've been pushing very hard in that period to really make accessible as much of the, the collection as pos possible. Um, so when the Google Art Project uh, came to us and said, "Look," We can squeeze you in at the very last, last minute. Uh, we pushed very hard to make as, make as many of the works we had digitised available. Um, and this, this has been a pro project I've been working on around making, accessible muse uh, making museum collections widely accessible uh, for uh, many years now. Um, so this is just a bunch of short slides. So this is the Cooper Hewitt, but this is where, where, I, where I was. We were a, a very large design and science museum in uh, Sydney, Australia, much um, but larger than um, but the, Cooper, the, Cooper, the Cooper Hewitt. One of the things I've noticed in the last dec decade really is that what a, what a museum is has changed as a result of tech, tech, technology and media, ch change, changes in media, that museums now are about publishing and broad, broadcast, and as um, Nick Poole, the head of the Collections Trust in the UK says, also about this locative experience, but it isn't just a locative muse um, experience that occurs within galleries, it's a locative experience that occurs in the world. Also now, tech, tech, technology has changed the visitor's experience because museums have got to be much, much clearer about what their physical experience is, is about. Museums now, now people can carry things around in their pockets and get ac access to images of, um, um, of collections. Museums' physical spaces need to be more assertive about the role of actually seeing the real thing in their, their actual space itself. Ten, ten years ago, we were working at the powerhouse on this idea of the virtual museum, this encyclopedic resource that we thought was, auth was authoritative. But what else occurred in 2001? Wikipedia launched. So this idea that a museum could, um, could, could claim authority was kind of a little bit uh, ridiculous. Uh, we thought we were in control of the experience. Two, 2001. 2011, this is, this is um, the work I was doing when I left the powerhouse, was taking the museum's collection out to the rest of the world where the images from our collection made more sense in the locations where they were taken than, than on a gallery's wall. So this idea in 2011 that the museum was becoming a museum without walls, museums were becoming data providers, much as libraries were, that authority was, was, was based on the context, not who, um, who kind of museums were, but the context in which museums spoke, because the user was in, con was in, con was in control. 
Um, and, I, and I developed at the powerhouse this idea of the post web accord, that the museum exhibit halls were about the experience of stuff, physical stuff, because the web gives access to all the information around the, the, the kind of stuff itself. And museums, of, um, of course, are a way that the cult cultures tell kind of you know, stories, but increasingly these are collective forms of you know, storytelling. I'll just skip forward a, a bunch here because uh, we, we should just do, do some skipping. So museums have issues, a lot of issues. And one of the most exciting things other than the GAP that launched re recently was the Walkers um, new website. The Walkers site covers things that are not in their own galleries. And this is really exciting because the first, the first provocation that I'd ask is, how do we turn museums, di digital spaces, to become nodes? Not um, des de destinations, but nodes in a net network of other uh, museums. Another project, uh, James Bridle's project that looks at Wikipedia, this is an 11 volume encyclopedia set of all of the edits to the article of the Iraq war for a decade in Wikipedia. Now, when I look at what, how uh, museums d document collections, we see this. We see none of the changes in the way cur cur curators or researchers have de 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 described things. How do we change the way museums document things to, to reflect the way the, ob the objects change through, through, through time? The powerhouse, we worked a lot on uh, very detailed catalogue rec records. This is a powerhouse collection record for a fabric. This is, the, this is a similar record up the top at the Cooper Hewitt. So we're really working to expand doc documentation and to show change. Um, the way I see the Cooper Hewitt, one of the first thing, things I did was push all our collection metadata, all our, um, um, all our res 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 research out with a public domain licence. Because the way I kind of see uh, collection data is that collection data is cultural source code. It is the way people make cult, 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 culture and de de describe the past to create a new kind of future. Some of the work I was doing on the powerhouse too was about looking at the ways people use collection data. So this is um, heat maps of the most cut, cut and pasted parts of documentation <laughs> by school kids. Right? So importantly, tailoring the experience for particular user, user, user groups. How do we use data that is generated by digital services, web applications, mobile de 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 devices to better design experiences? This is a heat, heat, heat mapping project we were doing of our gallery spaces that looked at the way people moved through gallery spaces using Wi-Fi tracking. And this, uh, this was allowing us to better, can, better think about the ways we physically de de design museum space spaces because the way people move through our spaces is change, changing as a result of tech, technology too. Um, the last thing uh, is how do we now, in the presence of the art, art project, reconsider what a physical museum visit is? What does the, imp the impact of Street View within, um, inside a museum do to the way visitors behave in our physical spaces? This is a project from a museum in um, uh, Hobart, uh, which when you visit, you act, act, are actually following up your, your visit. You get sent a 3D rep representation of your path through the museum. Not only that, you only get ac ac access to the collection, a fantastic private collection, when, when, when you have physically visited. And it shows the works that you haven't seen as well as the ones you have seen. What they have done is provide every visitor with a mobile device and taken away every, every, every sing, single bit of documentation and text, text panelling in the entire building. Now what this does is opens up space for complete free freedom for exhibit de designers to rethink the way physical spaces are designed without text. Um, this, is, this is very, uh, this is a fa fascinating thing. And um, as you can see, the other benefit of this, which excited me, was the ability for them to, to create heat maps and track the way visitors move through their, their, their spaces and redesign galleries uh, in a way that has not really been, been possible previously. So this is an analytics view of the way visitors behave as a result of having all of this data, data available. The final thing, I guess, is we think that digitising 2D things is a threat now. 
we're digitising 3D things. And what happens when visitors, particularly school kids and teachers, can in fact print exact replicas of works of art or designed works in my, my case at school? How does that change the way ed education works in museums? This is the next challenge for us. And the Smithsonian's already begun doing this. We've been doing uh, 3D scanning. And, and at the Cooper, Cooper Hewitt, we're really looking to utilise this in our reopening in uh, 2014. So this is some of the changes that are really uh, coming in the very near kind of future. So, cool. Thank you very much. Eve? <laughs> um, my name is Eve Morris Ortega, and I'm from Art 21. Uh, Art 21 is an independent nonprofit. Actually, we're not part of PBS. We're very well known for our PBS series, which is actually currently airing its sixth season right now on Fridays. So tune in this Friday. Um, but Art 21's mission is to inspire a more creative world through the work and words of living artists. And we've been around um, for over 10 years now, and our main activity is documenting the artists of our time. So from the beginning, we've always relied on technology, really video at first, but increasingly now, of course, it's the internet. Um, and it's really interesting to hear the other panelists because we struggle um, with the, with the uh, benefits and challenges of being a virtual space from the get-go. Um, and we've always seen ourselves as um, a complement to, to museums and artists because we're making accessible how these artists make their work, why they do so, by bringing access to the artists directly to broad audiences through digital technologies. Um, Art 21 was founded with access in mind. Our executive director previously had founded another nonprofit called Independent Curators International, which was really about a museum without walls, bringing um, bricks and mortar exhibitions to underserved communities. And she had done that for many, many years when she'd been asked by the local PBS affiliate here in New York, WNET, to serve as the visual arts consultant for a weekly art magazine. And the light bulb went off that this was a way to exponentially increase um, that level of access and to really democratize uh, access to the artists of our day. Because one thing she had noticed in traveling around the country for these traditional museum exhibitions was that very few people actually knew the artists of our time. Um, you know, I think older art sort of sifts down and becomes part of, <clears throat> you know, more, it, it's just better known, you know, but whereas uh, when asked when she would ask people who was, you know, the most recent artist they knew, you know, they would really struggle and be like, uh, who's the guy who does, you know, the Campbell soup cans or, you know, the lonely people in the diner or just or like Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, there was just a real um, sort of absence of, of uh, access to the artists of our time. So that is really what we do. And our best known project, Art in the 21st Century, which is airing, as I said right now, is in its sixth season. It's had over 20 million viewers now. We've profiled 100 of the most um, you know, amazing artists of our time. And it started out uh, based mostly in the United States. But as the art world has become increasingly globalized, the artists that we have, you know, we, we realized at the beginning we had um, major funding from the National Endowment for the Arts at the very beginning. And so a curatorial criteria at the beginning was that the artist had sort of a foothold in the United States. Um, but through the years, we've realized that it's, it's not so meaningful anymore because uh, being an artist today, by necessity, you're all over the globe. Um, so whether it's artists who are based outside of the US and are coming here for exhibitions or vice versa. So we now really have a very global roster of artists whom, whom we profile. Um, in addition to our flagship series, we have now a uh, various online projects only. So broadcast television was really how we started. But again, everything is migrating online. And we even see that in how people view our material. So you know, we, we were one of the top DVD sellers for PBS. And now increasingly, everybody's just you know, seeing us streamed or download to own. Um, and we also have new content streams that are really destined for online only. So one of those is exclusives, and those are additional films from the artists in the series. But then we have a new series called New York Close-Up, which was um, very much about 
a very geographically limited group of artists here in New York City, sort of artists in our own backyard who are you know, in the first decade of their careers. So that's something that we just started last year um, with uh, support from the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, and another huge effort of Art21 is education. So the, we see the video as a jumping off point to reach students, teachers, lifelong learners, informal, uh, you know, informal learners globally, and the internet has really been crucial to our efforts to do that. Um, and then we also complement that with events. So right now, with, with the launch of each new season of the series, we have an initiative called Access, and it grew sort of grassroots in the very beginning, and then it snowballed each time where people who'd had events the first time, screenings in their community, tailoring it to what worked best in their community, inviting local artists. We also, our programs are theme-based. So, um, you know, if we have a history hour, they might invite local historians. If they have, um, you know, something about uh, change, you know, which is one of the themes of this season, you know, they might invite political activists because that particular program this season is very political. So, uh, the events have really grown and they're all geared towards access and I think it's, but you know, we, we struggle with uh, some of the questions um, being posed here about providing access while at the same time having that be a starting point. Um, not the end in itself, because our goal is always to turn on that interest uh, in contemporary art that would then lead to people actually going to see the objects in person. And you know, it's, I, I was very interested in our preliminary conversations, even things about how do you represent the art digitally you know, there are challenges with that. So uh, this is very interesting for, uh, for me because this is something we deal with all the time because we, you know, we're sort of, we were a technological institution from the beginning because we're dealing with reproductions to make them accessible to uh, very broad-based audiences. Thank you so much. <clears throat> George? Yes. Well, uh, my name is Jorge Colombo. I am from Lisbon, Portugal, and I moved to the United States in 1989. I have worked mostly as an illustrator for the past few decades, and I was working mostly on, illustra uh, on urban landscapes in watercolor for a long time. But as time, uh, in the past few years, I started working on, uh, with my finger on an iPhone, and after a couple of years, uh, upgraded to an iPad. Now I work both. So uh, the earlier part of my career was purely analog, so to speak. I mean, I, I was working just with brushes and uh, painting and uh, making mistakes and going back and changing. And I have the fondest rec recollections of uh, the tactile aspects of, uh, um, of the materials. But uh, at this point, all I do is on a, on a touch screen, and I can say really that the honeymoon is still not over. I'm still enjoying it. Um, and what is pleasant to me is the immediacy and the fact that uh, the materials do not uh, cease to be to to be, uh, to be on, on, the, on the way. Um, it's almost like my finger is willing colors and willing shapes to happen without having any physical uh, inter, uh, um, inter, uh, mediation. I compare the, the way that, uh, of working on, 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 <clears throat> on a touch screen to working on a piano. You feel like your fingers are just magically making sound, and yet, of course, there's a complicated machinery that is hidden inside the black box, but you don't need to know that. Uh, the other thing that I take a lot of advantage is the fact that uh, this becomes much faster to dissemin disseminate uh, the idea that you can uh, reproduce it, the idea that you can access it, the idea that you can post it online and just circulate it f fast. Uh, even if you depend in a lot of cases of uh, printing and it's still the de facto uh, main circulation for a work like mine, what is interesting to me is uh, 
the idea that you can reach people that would be somehow limited to reach you otherwise, as in people that would be too far away to be able to buy the books or publications where I was being shown. Um, we have come to a situation, which I find very encouraging, where um, it's not so much an issue of being famous for 15 minutes. It's more being meaningful for at least 15 people anywhere in the world at the same time. And sometimes it's not 15, it's 1,500 or 15,000. But at least those 15 people that might be a little out of the way for them to come to whatever gallery, I will be showing something. And that, uh, that niche that happens is uh, quite exciting. The other thing that I feel about the tool that I'm using is that uh, is quite encouraging in raising the level of uh, amateur uh, art practice. And to me, that is just very important to, to everybody, starting with art cons producers and art generators and art in, in, gener in the professional art has only to gain from the participation of amateurs, just like the same way that sports have a lot to gain from people that have a sense of physical awareness and fit fitness. I think the, the fact that uh, uh, art is practiced by people in an amateur capacity, being it people playing music in any analog or any digital instrument, people painting or people writing just for their own, raises the general level of uh, uh, art enjoyment and art, the, the sophistication of the audience. And I try to encourage people to do that. Um, Sure, uh, it's been hard, in, 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 uh, it, it's been easy for uh, many years to get a sketch pad or getting a canvas and work on your own, but a lot of people don't go out of their way to get such tools, uh, uh, such materials. Yet, when it comes to, for instance, in a, an iPhone, it's something, it's like a, a Swiss Army knife that people have in their pocket. It's a tool that people use for Many other things, they have already made the investment, they have that, that tool somewhere, be it a computer, in their lives. And uh, so it's not that complicated to add a next uh, little app and going farther and, and, and experiment, be it with photographs or with music or whatever. Um, but the other thing that I feel is that um, this conversation makes more sense right now and pretty soon it will stop being making sense, it will just be a given. Uh, a lot of things that we don't even think of as technology, like pens that, don't, that you don't need to dip, or the idea that you can make a Xerox or you make a phone call, all these are, you know, eyeglasses were, 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 were avant-garde technology at some point, and now it's old news. So anything that we do now, pretty soon will be so ingrained in our culture and in our fabric of our lives that it don't even think about it. We, we don't even think of uh, that it makes a difference. It's, it's just been there forever. So, thank you. Thank you. Before we move ahead, let me ask the audience a question. How many people here have seen Google Art? How many people have not? Okay. So um, uh, I think I, I was going to ask Mark to demo it, but it looks like the, mo the majority of us have actually experienced the, um, uh, the program. So uh, it means we get to spend a little bit more time in uh, conversation. Um, and I guess what, what I would like to start by uh, asking, and I guess I'm going to start with you, Mark, since um, uh, in, in terms of the Google Art Project, uh, this uh, started with you. Do you think that there is something um, special about seeing the work live on the wall, or is that, as George was suggesting, a, a kind of privileging of experience that is passing us by? Well, um, I mean, there's several aspects of that. Um, you know, the, the typical museum shows a tiny fraction of its collection on the wall. Uh, you know, the, the Louvre has 230,000, 230,000? 230 million. It's got a 230 million. It's got 230 million objects in its collection, 
and they show like a half a percent of that. So yeah, going to the museum and experiencing it directly, if you can, if you can do that, is wonderful. Uh, and you know, this is sort of the same debate that, that the movie people had when VCRs came out and TV and, oh, it's going to destroy the movie experience and movies are doing better than ever and we watch movies on our TVs at home and, and on DVDs and Blu-rays and somehow all the new ways of, of experiencing things, these things don't actually detract from the old ways. They just represent more ways of thinking about them and accessing them. You know, and you can imagine putting all these 230 million things from the Louvre and 500 million from the Smithsonian and so on, putting all of them online and letting people look at them. Imagine, imagine how many other Caravaggios remain undiscovered, right? I mean, he, he, after he died, he was sort of forgotten for 400 years, rediscovered. You know, well, there's a lot of art that nobody looks at other than curators, and there's a tiny number of curators. They don't have time. What's out there that we don't know about? So, Eve, do you have any sense of anxiety from the artists you work with about how the use of technology may be beginning to inflect their work uh, in ways that aren't perhaps as conscious as George's practice? For example, I'm starting to hear some rumblings that uh, folks are saying um, operas at the Met are now staged with an eye towards uh, HD production. Um, is that a good mm. thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that even a thing? Um, well, you know, I, I, when I look at the artists we've profiled, uh, I, I do think that it is just another tool. I mean, I, um, so I think it really depends on the artist. I mean, I, I, interestingly, I mean, and I felt this at the, uh, the recent Whitney Biennial, I also think a lot of artists are actually looking at technology um, maybe with a certain nostalgia now, and I and I um, I think it really runs the gamut because we have profiled so many different artists where um, there are artists who incorporate digital technology as a yeah as a new tool to maybe explore ideas that they've been working with all along, um, and the technology allows them another way to explore those ideas, um, whereas some other artists I think might be looking at you know what does it mean that certain technologies are becoming obsolete and what do we lose when that happens? Um, you know, we actually just made a film about William Kentridge who, around his opera at the Met, The Nose, um, and which, you know, relied heavily on video projections. Um, but, you know, what's also interesting is, is uh, I think it's interesting how artists use technology and sometimes combine very low tech uh, methods with high tech. So I don't, you know, I think sometimes people, it's kind of like what you were saying, George, but, you know, when you say technology, I think people think cutting edge, cutting edge, and yet sometimes um, there's a blend in which you can, you know, we actually, really what Art21 tries to do is to go behind the finished object and show, you know, how things are made. And so we were filming um, William Kentridge making some of these videos. And there are these very beautiful, you know, films. But when you see how they're made, a lot of times he's got like a fan blowing paper. I mean, it, you know, and he just happens to be recording that. But so the effect might sort of, you know, be projected and look very high tech. But the way it was made incorporates very simple uh, means and sometimes very, you know, old fashioned means that come from, I mean, you know, we were just talking before George, but you know, you, some, of, some of your methods, even if, um, I mean, when George was showing me how he was making these incredible finger paintings, I, I doubt you would be so good at doing that had you not had the training and the ability that came from working with traditional techniques. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's a hard question to answer because I think it just really depends on the artist. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's, there are, you know, you, you know, there are things that, uh, I think seeing work in person is a different experience, though, than seeing it online, but I, that doesn't mean that one is better than the other. Um, I just think they're different, and so, and I also think another interesting um, trend, it seems, is that there seems to be m more performance-based work now, and I, and sometimes I just wonder if that's a reaction on the part of artists to kind of um, 
uh, you know, sort of instigate a collective experience, which, which you know, requires that people see something live as opposed to mediated you know, through a screen in a potentially you know, solitary way. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that answers yeah, the question. Yeah, no, I think uh, it, it, it's all interesting. And, and Seb, picking up on something that, that George said about using technology as a way I don't think this is, George, what you actually said, but of sort of bridging the gap between professional and amateur. Um, what, in your experience, is that a goal? How does, how does one harness increasing informal participation, which I believe is the new phrase, um, around, as in non-professional yeah. um, activity? Is, is, you know, and ultimately, is that going to productively or destructively erode the, the notion of professional versus amateur? Um, I mean, I think it's, it's incredibly productive, but I think it poses a great challenge for, for, for museums in collecting. And I think, think the real challenge now is for museums uh, to collect more, more broadly. Um, and when works are being born di digital, what does collect, collecting a work actually mean? How is that work collected? And how do you dif differentiate the work, say, of George versus some, someone else using a similar app? The, the, the ideas about how and what museums collect are more threatened than actually the works them, uh, them, them, themselves. And there's certainly a growing um, transparency to what used to, used to be quite opaque in museum practice. And I think that that's... Uh, both exciting and challenge, challenge, challenging for museums as well. And I think, you know, in, in that, uh, what, what gets exhibited becomes quite interesting too, because as more works become di di digitised and parallel to GA, GA, GAP, we have initiatives like Europe, Europeana that's uh, taking millions of uh, works from European collections and making um, them all, all freely available at high kind of, high kind of resolution. Uh, initiatives like Back Home in Oz, uh, uh, Collections Net Networks and uh, Canadian Virtual Museum and all these sort of projects, na national scale pro projects as well as um, continental scale projects, all of these are, these are beginning to, to make the many, many, many works that are not available for physical viewing in museums suddenly available and that makes visitors ask, well, why can't I see these? And, and this is one of the things that we, we found at the powerhouse when we made our collection available on the kind of line, um, all of the di digitised works, which represented about 50% of the, the collection in two, uh, two, 2006. And we implemented recommendation systems and um, smart kind of search, search, searching tools and all these social tools then. Um, one of the things we found was that the inquiries to, 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 to cur curators skyrocketed. We had a tenfold growth in curatorial phone calls and emails in the first three months. And the things that were the most popular things on our web website, some of them had nev never ever been considered for putting on public show. And this really challenged us to think, well, what does a future exhibit look, look, look like? And one of the exhibits we did um, on 80s pop culture in 2009-10, um, uh, 50% of the, ob the, ob the objects that were, were, were put on show were in, f were in fact uh, loans from uh, uh, the community who we had curated through social media channels. So we'd actually gone out to the pub public and said, what are the things that, that matter to you about 80s uh, pop popular culture? We didn't collect them, but these are the things that matter. And 50% and of the show was these things that the community had loaned and the museum created an environment and a space for this mix of uh, museum collected things and community collected things. And I think they, these are things that um, are very challenge, challenging to traditional museums. So George, following up on that, when I was in college there was sort of a sassy bumper sticker making the round that said modern art is I could have done that plus but you didn't. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and you know Given what Seb has said about the fact that, that, among other things, technology makes a degree of virtuosity accessible to people who haven't necessarily had uh, the training, do you think that there is still a valid distinction between the, the kind of training and practice and extraordinary talent that a professional artist like you has and uh, the work of 
a amateur that may have talent, but not, you know, sort of the, the depth of engagement with the practice? How do, are, are you threatened by technology as a tool of encroachment? Or? No, not really. I mean, uh, um, basically there are problems that you solve by uh, throwing money at them, and problems that you solve by throwing ideas at them. If you are short of one, you may try to compensate uh, with one of the others. If you are poor, you come up with a creative idea. And if you have no ideas, but you have funding, you just toss the money at it. But really, there are the right things and there, there are the wrong things to do. Artists will always find some way of bringing an additional magic, an additional personality to the work. Sometimes it may be just like blowing a fan in a creative way, like Kentridge would do. And it has nothing to do with having more, um, uh, fun, uh, more, more resources or more equipment. So it's simply an idea uh, solution. And what, what is interesting is that as technology becomes more democratized and more simplifying, we certainly do not let money get on the way, which is sometimes a little harder to get than ideas. And uh, I prefer that people have uh, do things, do any art without having to worry about the overhead, without having to worry about the sophisticated equipment or the inaccessible equipment. Um, and we'll figure out a way of uh, making it more uh, um, remarkable from the part of the artist. I mean, there is always somebody that will stand out in a more interesting way. But even as a practicing artist, I ultimately feel like it's more important to have a society of amateur artists than a society of, of professional artists. If, if there is one choice, I would prefer the amateurs. And I think, I, think, I mean, it's a little far-fetched to compare this to, say, sports, but what would be more important? A society where there were only professional athletes, but nobody else could go to a gym, or a society with no professional athletes, but people were working out on a regular basis, or at least had access to that, riding bicycles, swimming. I feel like it's more important for the general, um, um, for the general uh, health of society that people are doing things in an empowered way, then concentrate too much on the stars, the professionals, which are, you know, ultimately, I mean, an artist, a talented artist, ultimately sort of like an anomaly. It's somebody that is doing things in a slightly different, more engaged way than most people. It's a wonderful analogy about the professional athletes. Thank you. And one, one last question for the whole panel, and then um, we can and should open it up to the audience. Just wondering, given, given what we've discussed to date, where would each of you draw the line between technology and art? Is there, uh, obviously, I think at the polar extremes, it's pretty clear what the difference is. But um, what do you think is a valid distinction um, between the two? And, Mark, on behalf of your parents, I'm going to start with you. Well, I mean, technology is, is inherently a, a, a set of tools for doing anything. I mean, I would, I would argue that mastering pigments and making paint is a technology. And, you know, art is a, is a way of communicating between people um, or maybe from a person to, you know, over time or something like that. But it's... Uh, art is really about about human beings and their relationships, their emotions, the way they see the world, and how they relate to one another. And technology is is just another set of things that you use in the process of doing that. Whether you sing or paint or dance or sculpt or whatever it is, you're expressing something. It's a communication vehicle, and technology is just a uh, an enabler of that process. So Marshall McLuhan's fav famous postulate that the medium is the message or is the massage, depending on <laughs> which version you, you, you it's, read. It's wrong. Um, it's just wrong. It's just totally wrong. Okay. Seb? Yeah, I, I mean, I'd agree with, with Mark. You know, I think it's, it's the tech, tech, Thumbs down technology to McLuhan to also. It's just really a tool. Um, you know, I think if, if I've got any purpose in what I do with my 
current current role is to make it ob uh, not exist in five five years time. I mean, di digital and tech technology is just a means to an end, and I think it's about the end itself and being clear about what what that end is that really matters. And and that end. Uh, it's about human experience, I think. It's about human experience and, and inter, interpersonal communication. It's not about, uh, the, it's not about the medium. It's, it's not, not about the tools used. And, and the human experience you're describing sounds like it's pretty individualized and democratized. It's not sort of the a, no, no, a, a, a pyramid of connoisseurship. I would say socialized. Um, I think it's about, uh, like you know, George said, it's about creating a better, better, better society collectively. Eve? Yeah, I, not to keep echoing, but um, I, I do, I, I, I will echo. Um, you know, I do think that there's, it raises questions because of, you know, the, the slogan you raised about, you know, modern art is something I could do. I mean, I, I, you know, increasingly, um, well, I mean, artists, you know, have fabricators a lot of the time, and, um, you know, that's a whole art practice that on the one hand is very... Uh, Do you want to just explain what that is? Because not all well, civilians so understand. Well, many, many of the artists we work with. So for example, Inigo Manglane Ovale, you know, he made a bulletproof umbrella, for example. He made a sculpture of, a, a, of an umbrella made out of Kevlar. Um, and, or Matthew Ritchie made a, um, made a uh, sort of a, a, a sculpture that was based on a drawing that had very complex shapes. Um, and to actually cut those shapes required taking his drawing, bringing it to a fabricator that had the laser cutting, three-dimensional laser cutting that could actually then, you know, make that um, in a three-dimensional form. So many times artists come up with an idea, but they have to look to a fabricating company to actually, you know, execute it. Um, but at the same time, or Jeff Koons is another artist we uh, profiled, you know, on the one hand, these things might, so he has an army of people who are actually making his sculptures, his paintings, but the artist comes up with the idea. Um, so I think these questions about well, what is art and why, you know, why is this, you know, why, what, what is special about what the artist is doing if it's not his or her hand making it? I mean, many of the artists, you know, hand is involved, um, but technology allows things to be made that maybe spring from the artist's idea, even if the artist, I, you know, isn't touching every piece of it, and yet, you know, going back to the Renaissance, you know, there were always studios that had many, you know, assistants fabricating things, or, you know, it was this kind of fabrication, even if it was done with the hand. So it's a little bit like, you know, more it changes, more it stays the same. So I think it's, um, you know, it's tools, and you have an idea to communicate something, and then you figure out how to realize that idea, and technology is, um, you know, m making a bulletproof umbrella out of Kevlar or making a sculpture with lasers, you know, is, is something that was only possible now, but I think it's an extension of the same impulse that went back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, so. So, so art as a handmade authentic object is a little bit nostalgic anyway. I mean, again, I think, I do think it's changed, but I, but I still think the premise of having an idea that you want to turn into an object hasn't necessarily changed. It's just how do you get there? And I think technology allows different ways of getting there. George? When I think of, <clears throat> I can think of many arts that do not involve technology. I can think of um, singing, uh, dancing, acting, and I'm running out of others. Everything else, I mean, uh, writing a poem or taking a photograph resorts to technology that at some point was cutting edge, and now it's just part of the past. But uh, um, basically, we are always using uh, some tool of some sort. Uh, when we are doing a oil painting, we are using technology that uh, a very complicated industry pipeline that ends up in a tube of, of paint. So uh, it's been always there. Uh, so. Most of it, uh, we, uh, most of art has always been using some sort of technology, and it will always continue. It's just uh, a matter of being the novel, uh, being a novelty or not. I would say more than that, artists are often the very first to exploit new technology and see it as a as a as a new way to express something that they couldn't as easily or couldn't in that way before. 
um, they tend to explore the yeah. possibilities that the technology offers before anybody else does. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, having been, been involved in national scale collaborative projects back home, mm -hmm. Uh, some of the issues around collaboration are US based problems. Um, uh, certainly, uh, def definitely in the Commonwealth nations and Europe, Europe, European nations that have centralised national funding for the arts uh, and public institutions with public collections, uh, whilst there has been a resistance uh, initially around um, the interoperability and nas national federated search and these sorts of things. These are problems that were solved five to ten kind of years ago and uh, where, where we now see things is um, uh, the opportunity now to expand that globally and, and, and I think there has been a sea change in museums now and, and the GAP is a great example of some of the benefits that, that come at, globe, at uh, global scale now. Certainly the dif difference between GAP version one a year ago and now is immense. But what's been fascinating is again looking at the conservatism of the US museums in putting contemporary works in. Whereas I look back, back home and in the New Zealand museums, the Asian museums, they have contemporary works there. They have indigenous works there. They have works that are very hard to, to, clear, uh, to, to, to clear rights rights on, and yet they have gone and done it. Uh, and this, this is why I think you know there, there, there is uh, hopefully now uh, the American museums will look at the, the, the museums from much much smaller nations and go well they they did it and it's embarrassing that we haven't done it <laughs> you know uh, and and in some ways I, I you know. Um, be, being at the Smithsonian now and, and looking at the Cooper Hewitt's con, you know, contribution, we came in two, two months prior, prior to, uh, to um, launch and because of the non-disclosure um, agreements, we didn't know which other p participants were involved in the second, second round. We didn't know how many collection pieces other, um, other museums were, were putting in. We put in 1,600 works. Rough, 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 roughly, and I was kind of embarrassed at that small amount. And yet I look at the other Smithsonian's who have put in 500 or 50 works. That's embarrassing, you know. Um, it's about being bold around this this sort of uh, stuff. And I think it's great that Google's done this because it is beginning to put the the international national context on. Uh, boldness in museums, but also the rights issues and, and, and the globalisation of copyright um, and, the ex and the extension of cop copyright, often against artists' own wishes. Um, yeah. Mark, Let do you want to take that I'd like to put a little on? context on some of this because um, we think of museums as eternal things, partly because the stuff that they display is often quite old and eternal. But the, the notion of a museum as a institution full of art open to the, or artifacts open to the public is a relatively new invention. Uh, the British Museum was one of the first major museums that opened to the public in the 1850s. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, before that museums were private things for the, for the royalty and the nobility. Uh, museums are still a relatively new concept. Um, for the art project, interestingly enough, it was, it, it was a, quite a sort of a gamble for us uh, it was successful with the public. The turning point in our relationships with the museums was an interview given by the head of the Uffizi uh, some months after the first phase of the art project opened when he pointed out that the, uh, you know, the art project, which links back to the museum's own websites, had driven a 5x growth in the web traffic to the Uffizi's website. He said, but moreover, it doubled the foot traffic. Uh, and, and since at this stage of the evolution of the business models of museums, foot traffic is the gold standard, mm -hmm. this was the, the, the thing that they had been worrying most about. Would the web traffic uh, cut into the foot traffic? And, and to their delight, it actually helped it. Uh, and that, at that point, the museums began tearing our doors down, uh, trying to get into the next phase of the project. So, so what we're seeing is the evolution of thinking within a large uh, community which is tasked with a very substantive uh, custodial task. And so they can't be 
casually, you know, silly with their, with their assets. And so they do have to work somewhat gradually and somewhat cautiously, uh, even though, you know, the hardcore geeks sort of, we see the future, we know exactly where to go, why don't you just go there? Well, it's not that easy. You actually have to figure it out and make it work. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'd, I, I would say, though, that, uh, you know, many of the times the contributions, um, there were more available works that museums have already on their own web websites that, that, that were, that, sh that should have been available to GA, 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 GAP. Um, and I think, you know, now um, that I do hope that museums will up, up, will continue to add more now um, that, that, that they can. I, I, I think the other thing that's great about the GA, GA, GAP project is cleans up the messy metadata that museums have, the descriptive text, the, the artist names that vary slight, slight, slightly between museum to, to museum. The behind the scenes work at the GAP has, has norm, normalised some of um, that data, but more, 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 more importantly, muse, museums can now down, download their cleaned up data Finally, so Google's actually providing another um, um, another service behind the scenes, which is cleaning up museums' messy data, uh, which I do hope that museums r realize is incredibly valuable and actually makes the interop op, 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 uh, the, the goals of the the global search much easier, not only for GAP but for their own web <laughs> websites and other nas national scale pro projects. Um, but that's, that's one of the less publicly visible goals of this. It's more in, internal to museums. I, I also want to say at Art21, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure what form this would take in terms of a collaboration, but I, I do think that we struggle a lot and, and um, look to technology for making our assets more useful. So jumping off on what you're saying, because we have a tremendously valuable archive now. I mean, you know, we have documented these artists and many of them, you know, getting access to their studios, their homes, you know, their daily lives is a, is a real privilege that we've um, had. And it's, you know, from like Bruce Nauman, Richard Serra, Louise Bourgeois, you know, and some of these artists are no longer with us. So we've had museums come to us as sort of a record of even, you know, when Elizabeth Murray had a show at the, at the Museum of Modern Art, they came to us to study how she was making her paintings through our films. Her, their conservators were looking to us as the record for that. Um, and because education is so important to us, searchability is huge because what we hear from educators is that they all need to tailor their lesson plans and we have such rich content, but for them to navigate that, um, you know, having better tools to search, tag, organize, and we're getting there. <laughs> but, you know, I think R21, like a lot of small nonprofits, you know, that's a, that's a struggle. And I think we, you know, look to, um, technological solution, like we just, you know, we did our website not so long ago. We had a really antiquated back end. We switched to a CMS finally. Um, but, you know, making those leaps when you're a small nonprofit is a real challenge. And so marrying kind of the richness of your content with the technological tools to make it truly um, as useful to your audiences as possible um, is something that I think, you know, small organizations and large ones um, can hugely benefit from. So, I mean, I know we're, we're really interested in figuring out ways to collaborate um, in order to do that with, with tech, tech companies. A lot of, uh, we are in a, in a difficult transitional uh, era where things are changing so fast that we have not uh, landed on a contemporary model for everything work in a correct economic way. My personal guess, my personal prediction, but I could be extremely wrong, is that a lot of uh, um, cultural consumption will uh, work uh, in a model not unlike the one of cable TV or Netflix, which is right now what we have, where you sort of like pay for uh, a stream of uh, material, be it reading, reading material or radio or music or, 
or visual content in, on, a, on a subscription system. But this could very well happen in a, in a different way. At any rate, the idea that there is a choice and that you can still seek up the origin of the actual object or just get at least a hint of it in, uh, in some kind of like a sort of digital way is a great start. You can do one or the other. Just like the same way that uh, the fact that you can access m recorded music, for instance, means that you have at least the idea of something that you might not even have heard of if you hadn't heard the record. And uh, of course, recorded music has not hampered in any way the attendance to live music of any sort, from classical music to popular music to entertainment. People still want that experience for what it is, but they wouldn't have even have heard about, say, opera or about reggae or whatever if they hadn't heard a record that was not available. So it's a great starting point. But yeah, uh, the dust needs to settle. At this point, we, 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 we don't know yet how things uh, are going to be negotiated and how things are going to be commercialized and what kind of like uh, s uh, system will be in place, but it's a matter of waiting. I don't think the objects are going to go away, right? I mean, in my apartment, I have lots of stuff hanging on the walls. I'm not a, a wealthy collector of things that end up in famous museums, but I have stuff that I like. And you know, while that you might think is not related to to the art museums that like like this one and the Met and the MoMA and stuff like that, it's part of a large ecosystem in which you know people create stuff for for the middle class as well as for as well as for these great uh, collections. Well, what's what's the difference between a a, how about a photograph? The original photograph is is whatever the little thing in my camera is, but I printed it and and it's on the wall. The other challenge is for, you know, for museums particularly, and you're, you've already seen museums becoming more, um, of more event spaces and building theatres like this to hold and host, host regular events. Yeah, but the real challenge, I think, for, for museums is the huge cost of preserving both their physical buildings that are oft, 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 often well, out, well outgrown their use, use, usefulness and flexibility, uh, but also preserving the physical collections. Um, and coming from the type of museums that I've worked at previously, there's a lot of things in um, museums that if they had the choice now to continue collecting them, they probably wouldn't have collected them. Um, and these are incredible issues because the preservation cost, the storage cost is so high for phys phys physical things. In digital things, it's high too because we haven't figured out digital preservation yet. Um, but, you know, we, we are lumbered with institutions in buildings that are not purpose-built uh, purpose, purpose and with collections that we can't exhibit physically at scale. Um, and we're trying, trying to figure out how to fund those. Um, and, you know, and also, um, also, also in many uh, small regional cities and towns, the populations are move, moving away towards large, large, larger cities and heritage museums p particularly struggle with collections for communities that no longer exist. 